Hello and welcome to the 21st in my series of presentations on the conflict between science and creationism. Today I'm going to be talking about the subject of the global flood mentioned in the Bible. In particular in this presentation I'll be looking at a number of claims made in the presentations of the infamous young earth creationist Kent Hovind. This means that I won't be covering the whole topic and I won't even be covering it in any sensible order. I'll just cover the topics that Hovind himself mentions. So let's get started. The story of the biblical flood is one of the cornerstones of young earth creationist thinking, which is unfortunate as it's wholly impossible and completely unsupported by any evidence. In fact, there is so much evidence showing that there has been no global flood in the last 10,000 years that it takes a very special brand of denial and delusion to believe that one might have occurred. Here's an overview of the details of the flood as reported by the Bible. It was supposed to have occurred around 4,500 years ago, in 2500 BCE or thereabouts. The timings given by Archbishop Usher in the mid-17th century was about 2348 BCE. The Bible says that the flood lasted a whole year, and that the flood waters covered the highest mountains. The highest mountain today is Mount Everest, which is over 8 kilometres or 5 miles in height above sea level. So that's how much water there was. Even if we assume that the Bible meant the highest mountain in that area, then that's probably Mount Ararat, which is a little over 5 kilometres or 3 miles high. That's still quite a lot of water. In addition, the biblical flood myth of Noah, which is found in the book of Genesis, shows clear signs of having been borrowed from the Mesopotamian flood myths during the time in which the Israelite people were held captive in Babylon in the 6th century BCE. There are also two conflicting accounts in chapters 6 and 7 of Genesis. In one account, God tells Noah to take two of every living thing. In another, he says to take seven of clean animals and two of unclean animals. Either way, given the millions of species currently alive on Earth, that's a lot of animals. Documented civilizations have existed back to well before the time at which the flood was alleged to have occurred, yet they show no evidence for it whatsoever. This one is by far the most overwhelming proof that no global flood ever occurred, even without using carbon dating methods, for example, which creationists famously don't understand, as I mentioned several times in earlier presentations. It is still possible to track the history of civilization back to way before the time of the alleged flood. In fact, you can track it nicely to well before the time when the Earth was allegedly formed, according to Genesis. Let's look at the Egyptian civilization, for example. The Old Kingdom of Egypt stretched back several centuries before the date of the alleged flood, and lasted for several centuries after it. During this time, hundreds of thousands of Egyptian labourers were building the Great Pyramids of Giza, amongst other projects, and were writing pyramid texts, holding ceremonies and burying pharaohs, the tombs for whom seem remarkably unperturbed by eight kilometres of water wishing past. There is no record whatsoever in any of the Egyptian texts of a flood happening at any time in the 3rd millennium BC, which wiped out every single person in the entire country. You'd have thought that they might have mentioned that somewhere, but it didn't seem to perturb them at all. Likewise, the Chinese and Indian civilizations have no records of this event whatsoever, as I mentioned in the presentation on archaeology earlier. Despite the claims of the creationists, we have no reliable corroborating stories from any other cultures. Apart from the Egyptians mentioned above, there were many other cultures at the time across Central Asia and all the way to China. There is no written record of a flood in any of these cultures that resembles the biblical flood in any more than extremely superficial detail. You'd have thought that that would be something that they might have recorded quite carefully. Apparently not. There's no physical model for how the flood could possibly have occurred. Creationists often put forward models such as the hydroplate hypothesis to explain the flood, but they're all utterly impossible. Apart from anything else, the remnant water would have to be findable by modern science, but it doesn't seem to exist. There's no point arguing about any of these models directly because they're all ridiculous, and they all have to somehow incorporate vast amounts of water both before and after the flood, not to mention explaining away the abject lack of evidence from the other sources, such as the others on this slide. For example, we have ice core evidence stretching back several tens of thousands of years, and there is no evidence whatsoever that there was a flood covering the whole Earth. In fact, if there had been a flood, then it would have totally melted the ice, and our ice core records would stretch back only four and a half thousand years. Creationists often dispute ice core evidence, but that's really without any basis. You can see more about this in the presentation on geology earlier. The amount of water required is so large that we would be able to locate it today. The flood myth tells about covering all the mountains on Earth, there is nowhere near enough water available to do this. We would need to hide Everest, which as I said earlier is something like 8 kilometres high, and we'd need to somehow be able to secrete all this water away somewhere under the crust of the earth. This much water could easily be detected by, amongst other things, seismic surveys. Water has different seismic properties from rock. 
Also, we would have found it by drilling by now. Of course, it doesn't exist. Genetic evidence shows us that no animal on Earth, including humans, went through a genetic bottleneck of only a few people or a few animals within the last 10,000 years. We can track the genetic diversity of a species, which tells us a lot about the time at which that species had a common ancestor. The range of different genes, alleles of genes, in the gene pool of a single species is a measure of the age of that species. If we see very little diversity, then this tells us that every individual in the species is descended from a recent common ancestor. If there are very many variations, however, then we know that the last common ancestor for that species must have lived a long time in the past, and hence there has been enough time for an extensive tree of descendants and very many random mutations, which accumulate slowly over time, at a known rate. We can actually do this very accurately, looking at the degree of genetic diversity and known mutation rates in various parts of the genome, and that gives us an estimate of how long ago any two species, or two members of the same species, shared a common ancestor. And lo and behold, the common ancestors for the species we see today are mostly vastly older than the proposed date for the flood. The Bible says that the ark contained two, or seven, depending on which account you read, of every kind of animal. But what is meant by kind? Creationists use this word as perhaps their most famous wriggle point in this argument. Apparently kind doesn't mean species, which allows them to get around the fact that there would need to be literally millions of pairs of creatures on the ark. It might mean body type in some vague sense, but then that is way too vague. And also it would mean that creationists have admitted that massively frequent speciation through natural selection occurred in the last four and a half thousand years since then, or otherwise, where do the species we see today come from? Whenever creationists attempt to define exactly which creatures were on the ark, they always shoot themselves in the foot for precisely this reason. How did the ark cope with the large animals? They would have totally trashed it, surely. It required two elephants, two rhinos, two hippos, etc., all running around, trampling, fighting, mating, etc. How did they store all the food and drink? Animals require wildly different types of food. What about the animals that need fresh vegetables? They were in the ark for approximately a year, after all, and they didn't have a fridge. People often think that they were in the ark for 40 days and 40 nights, which even that is impossible. But the Bible is very clear that the rains lasted 40 days, but the flood itself lasted approximately a year. If we assume that a human being can survive on, say, one litre of water per day, then that's already over two tonnes of water just for the humans. The water outside, of course, would be salty and hence undrinkable. Now add in the elephants. What about, say, the hummingbirds that require specific kinds of nectar? And so on. As you can see, just in this section alone, the arguments against the plausibility of an ark are insurmountable. The plans detailed in the Bible are not feasible. The ark would not have been stable for a start. The longest wooden ships in modern seas are about 300 feet long, and these require reinforcing with iron straps, and they leak so badly they must be constantly pumped out. The ark was allegedly 450 feet long. That's approximately 130 to 140 metres. It was allegedly 75 feet wide, or just over 20 metres, and 45 feet tall, or just over 12 metres. The best proof of this point is actually from a creationist source and I've included some information from this site here on this slide. In fact, he seems to have taken down this information since I retrieved it a few years ago. Clearly he realised that it sort of disproved the whole story that he was trying to prove. This site always makes me laugh because of the massive modern construction effort required to build the thing. They're using huge iron girders, cranes, bulldozers and concrete pillars, and his boat doesn't even have to float. And moreover, they can make it from any wood they like. They're not constrained to use the non-ideal cypress wood that the Bible talks about, which is substantially weaker than pine, for example. The Ark was a really big ship, even by modern standards, but especially by the standards of ships built of wood. In fact, if it had existed, it would have been the largest wooden ship ever constructed, by some margin. The actual largest wooden ship ever was the USS Wyoming, which was built in 1909, with the most advanced technologies available at the time. It was the same length as the Ark, at 450 feet, but was only two-thirds the width. Also, the actual hull length, which is what we should be comparing, was actually 100 feet shorter than the Ark. In order to attempt to hold this extraordinary vessel together, it took 90 large iron bracings, which of course were not available to Noah as he lived in the time before iron working had been discovered. And, needless to say, it was built using modern screws and nails, glues and carpentry techniques. Even taking all this into consideration, the USS Wyoming would still twist and buckle in high seas, and that's without a handful of four-ton elephants inside it. 
it required a mechanical pump to run continuously just to remove all the water that was seeping through the planks, which is something that Noah obviously didn't have access to, and, as a sad end to the story, it eventually fell apart and sank in 1924, killing all of the crew of 14. The moral of this story is very simple. Even disregarding the other problems that I'll cover in this presentation, the construction of a seaworthy wooden ship the size of Noah's Ark was not, and even now with modern techniques, still is not, and never will be, physically possible. Sometimes creationists mention particular design features, such as the moon pool, to add stability to the alleged Ark. A moon pool is basically a big hole in the hull of the vessel. Can you see where I'm going with this one? The first and most obvious point here is that adding such a device, which is not unheard of in modern vessels as it happens, would pose considerable construction problems to someone building a boat in 2500 BC. Adding in such complex joints in the wood would add new points of failure in the hull, weakening it considerably, and it would add plenty of new problems with water seeping into the vessel as we've already seen. Now recall that we've already seen that a wooden vessel of this size, even with modern technologies, is utterly unstable and prone to falling apart or just sinking. I have no idea if a moon pool would give enough stability to keep the arc upright. I doubt it, but I can't find any research looking at moon pools for anything other than practical purposes such as launching submersibles. Also, I'm not aware of any experiments testing this possibility directly. Maybe Hovin should set one up himself when he gets out of jail, but I bet he doesn't. More importantly, there is no mention of this moon pool whatsoever in the Bible, which seems very suspicious given the curious nature of this design and the detail of the rest of the description, which even goes down to the exact dimensions and the construction materials and to the precise location of the door in the roof and the number of decks inside. You would have thought that the addition of a feature as revolutionary as a moon pool probably would have been mentioned. Again, there's no mention whatsoever. Did amateur archaeologist Ron Wyatt find Noah's Ark on a hill in Turkey? Nope, what he found was a hill. Even the creationist organisation Answers in Genesis agrees with this. There is also a Wikipedia article on this which is easy to find if you search for it. Here's a quote from that same article. In 1996, ex-Navy salvage expert David Fassold co-authored a paper with geologist Lawrence Collins entitled Bogus Noah's Ark from Turkey Exposed as a Common Geologic Structure, which concluded that the boat-shaped formation was a curious upwelling of mud that merely resembled a boat. In April 1997, during sworn testimony during an Australian court case, Fasold repeated his doubts and noted that he regarded the claim that Noah's Ark had been found as, quote, absolute BS, end quote. I could probably go on for hours about Noah's Ark. There are many more practical questions about the animals, for example. How did the animals get to the Ark from the corners of the world? How did the Australian animals walk all the way to the Middle East through the sea? What about the creatures that require extreme heat or cold to survive? How did the beasts stay fit when cramped up inside? What about the animals who need to nest or burrow? And obviously, what about the smell? So I think anyone who looks at this story with even a modicum of honesty and intelligence must reject it outright. Noah's Ark is simply a fable, and is no more historical than any other prehistoric myth. Well, that's all for now. As ever, there's loads more information on my website at frame.net, where you can also find a transcript of this talk, and all the following ones and the previous ones, and you can keep up to date with my blog, as well as learning about some of my other work. See you next time when I'll be talking about the topic of longevity, and I'll evaluate the extraordinary claims that creationists make about people living for hundreds of years. Thanks for listening.